In this lecture, we'll talk about estrogens and anti-estrogens. Now we know that estrogen is a naturally occurring female reproductive hormone, which is mainly secreted from the ovaries, the adrenal glands, placenta, and to some extent from fat cells and breast tissue. Now estrogen has a wide variety of functions and how it acts is by binding to the nuclear receptors and regulating protein synthesis like all steroid hormones do. Estrogen has uh, two receptors. One is estrogen alpha receptor and the other is estrogen beta. Now most tissues have both of these receptors but ER alpha is mainly present in the vagina, ovary, breast, uh, hypothalamus and blood vessels while ER beta is present in the prostate and the ovaries. To understand the action of estrogen analogs and the antagonists, we need to understand the functions of estrogen first. It is responsible for growth and development of female sexual organs and secondary sexual characters. It is also responsible for the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle. It also contracts fallopian tubes and myometrium rhythmically. It makes the sperm entry easy by making the cervical secretion become thin, watery and alkaline. It promotes the growth of breast tissue, specifically the ducts. It decreases osteoclastic activity and thus prevents osteoporosis in premenopausal women. It increases HDL, which is the good cholesterol, and decreases LDL, and thus uh, that's why premenopausal women has have lower uh, risk of developing cardiac diseases. Also, it causes sodium and water retention, leading to edema. It enhances coagulability by increasing factor two, seven, nine, and ten, and this will be a major side effect of estrogen analogs. It also in decreases antithrombin three. It will induce the progesterone receptor synthesis as well. Now, estrogens will have a negative feedback control on the anterior pituitary. We know that hypothalamus secretes a GnRH, which then acts on the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. Then FSH will act on the graphene follicles to re release estrogen, which will then inhibit anterior pituitary only, not the hypothalamus. The estrogens can be divided into those that occur naturally and the synthetic analogs of estrogen. The synthetic estrogens can be further divided into those which are steroidal in nature and the others which are non-steroidal. The naturally occurring estrogens are estradiol which is the most potent and most abundant form, estrone and estriol which are the metabolic products of estradiol in the liver. Now these naturally occurring estrogens are not effective orally because they have a high first pass metabolism. They are metabolized by glucuronide and sulfate conjugation in the liver and then excreted in the urine and bile. In the intestine they can be um, degraded by bacterial flora and then enter enterohepatic recycling. The synthetic forms of estrogen uh, the steroidal forms are ethanyl, estradiol, mestronol, and tibulone. While the non-steroidal forms are diethyl stilbestrol and dienestrol. The synthetic estrogens have a wide variety of uses. Firstly, they can be used in oral contraception when they are uh, combined with progestins. They negatively inhibit the LH and FSH secretion and thus inhibit ovulation. Secondly, they can be used in postmenopausal women as hormone re replacement therapy. The short term therapy goal is to relieve menopausal symptoms such as hot flushes, night sweats, depression, insomnia, irritability, etc. While long term use is to prevent or delay osteoporosis and atherosclerosis to decrease coronary artery disease and also Alzheimer's. Now to inhibit the side effects produced by estrogen, we give progesterones as well in the last 12 to 14 days of each month therapy. And conjugated estrogens are uh, more favored for this um, hormone replacement therapy. The drawbacks can be increased risk of 
venous thromboembolism because we know estrogens cause coagulability, gallstones due to their excretion, and uterine, uterine bleeding, and also breast cancer due to the proliferative effect of estrogens. They can also be used in senile vaginitis, which is actually postmenopausal inflammation and atrophy of the vaginal tissue due to decreased estrogen, and for this cause, we use it topically. Estrogens are also used to relieve dysmenorrhea, that is painful muscle cramps. And for this purpose, estrogen and progesterone can be used together. And by negative feedback, they will inhibit the ovulation and an ovulatory cycles will be there which won't cause pain. Cyclic estrogen therapy can also be given in delayed puberty in females, especially uh, those with Turner syndrome or hypogonadism. The main goal is to decrease the risk of osteoporosis and develop secondary sexual characters. Their role in prostate carcinoma is only to improve the quality of life. The preferred treatment is GnRH, which will inhibit testosterone. The side effects of estrogen therapy will be the same as that caused by estrogen naturally. Uh, they can be nausea, vomiting, breast tenderness, edema and weight gain. Endometrial and breast cancer uh, risk is also there. Thromboembolic disorders are important, gallstones and liver disease, and to decrease the side effects in hormone replacement therapy, the dose should be decreased. Lastly, coming to the anti-estrogens and selective estrogen receptor modulators. In anti-estrogens, we have two types of drugs, one that competitively inhibit uh, estrogen receptors, and secondly, aromatase inhibitors. While to explain the selective estrogen receptor modulators, we can say that they are either partial agonists of estrogen receptors or we can say that they have a selective action on some tissues. Now the competitive estrogen receptor blockers will inhibit the negative feedback of estrogen on the anterior pituitary and thus increase the level of FSH and LH leading to ovulation. So we know where we can use this. We can use this in female, infertility also in male infertility and also in assistive reproductive technology. The drugs that act through this way are clomiphene citrate and fulvestrant. Clomiphene citrate is given orally and it has some adverse effects such as hot flushes, nausea, vomiting, headache, loss of hair, multiple pregnancies can be there because of uh, increasing the ovulation there can be ovarian cysts due to ovarian hyperstimulation and malignancy as well. There is weight gain and breast discomfort. The next drug is fulvestrant and its main use is in breast carcinoma where it will inhibit the estrogen receptors which cause the breast tissue uh, proliferation. Now, aromatase is an enzyme which will convert testosterone into estradiol. Remember, testosterone is also present in the female bodies but in low levels. So, aromatase inhibitors will actually decrease the estrogen level by inhibiting. So, naturally, its use will be in breast cancer to decrease estrogen levels. The side effects will include hot flushes. The drugs are letrozole, anastrozole, and Exemestain. Now the last type of drugs, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, I said that there are two ways to look at this class of drugs. One we can think of them as partial agonists or secondly we can think that they have a selective action on some tissues. To really understand the partial agonist concept, we'll look at their uses. Remember, partial agonists act as agonists in the absence of an agonist, but when an agonist is there, they will act as antagonists. For example, I decide to use them for osteoporosis. Now think, when will I do that? When I don't have estrogen in the body, for example, in postmenopausal women or hypogonadism patients. So when there is no estrogen, so serms being partial agonists will then act as agonists and help in osteoporosis. Now let's say I want to use it for breast cancer. Now in breast cancer, we have estrogen, so we want to inhibit that. So then this partial agonist will act as an antagonist in the presence of an agonist.
Now, if we use them in endometrial cancer prophylaxis or treatment, we know that estrogen is there. So when estrogen is there, then it will act as an antagonist again and work to our benefit to treating the cancer or even used prophylactically. To explain a side effect by this partial agonist concept, let's say that I'm using these serms in a postmenopausal woman for some reason and here I increase the risk of endometrial cancer. Why? Because postmenopausally there is no estrogen and in the absence of estrogen, these serms will act as agonists and thus increase uterine proliferation. The serms include tamoxifen, riloxifen and or meloxifene. Tamoxifen is a non-steroidal drug and undergoes enterohepatic recycling. Now, another way to understand these selective estrogen receptor modulators is simply by re remembering their selective action. For, for example, tamoxifen has estrogenic actions on some tissues and anti-estrogenic actions on others. The estrogenic actions on endometrium include endometrial proliferation. On the bone, it causes decreased risk of osteoporosis and on the plasma lipid, it will increase HDL and decrease LDL. So here we can see a side effect that is endometrial proliferation and thus endometrial cancer. The anti-estrogenic effects are on the breast tissue and on the peripheral sites. In the breast tissue, it will decrease breast proliferation and thus here there is a use. The next drug, riloxifen, also has estrogenic and anti-estrogenic actions. The estrogenic actions on the bone will decrease osteoporosis risk. On the lipids, it will cause increased HDL and low LDL, while on the blood, as a side effect, it will cause increased coagulability and thus the risk of DVT, thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism, etc. The anti-estrogenic actions are those on the breast tissue and on the endometrial tissue. So here, we can see a positive effect that is it can be used in breast cancer treatment and also in endometrial carcinoma. That's all about estrogens and anti-estrogens.